Hi! Welcome to Coffee and Real Talk for Writers, where we get real about the writing life. Writing might be a solitary activity, but becoming a successful author is anything but. So grab a cuppa, pull up a chair, and let's talk. Hello, and welcome to episode 10 of Coffee and Real Talk for Writers. I'm your host, Talina Winters, and I'm recording this on Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. So I made it to my first double-digit episode. Woohoo! Um, I've heard that many podcasts pod fade, as the term is, around 12 episodes, and I can see why that's a bit of a barrier. You get to that point, like I'm, I'm even feeling it already. It's like, oh, wow. It's it been another week already. <laughs> it's time to do this again. But it's mostly just challenges of life that are making me feel that way this week. Um, and uh, But, you know, challenges of life happen. They happen all the time. That never stops. So uh, I am going to continue doing this as much as I can, although I may, I'm going to talk a bit later in the episode about some of the recent changes in my life. Um, and uh, I'm, I intend to keep podcasting. Um, for now, I'm going to keep do it, doing it weekly, although there may be some interruptions coming up that I'll have to uh, adjust to. But so far, so good. Weekly it is. And I'm not planning to pod fade anytime soon. <laughs> Anyways, um, on to reader comments. Uh, I have one consistent commenter, uh, author and editor Brenna Bailey Davies, who's a friend of mine. Thank you so much, Brenna, for being so consistent and, and allowing me to read something here every week. I love it. Um, and if you want to leave a comment, I do have a link uh, when I get it working right. And I think I've got it figured out now. Uh, I put a link in the show notes that is directly to this episode on my podcast blog on my website. So you can go there and you can leave a comment anytime you want. And I'm going to have a question of the week at the end of this episode that you could respond to specifically, which is what Brenna has been responding to. Um, I've got two comments. She must've been catching up on episodes this week. Uh, episode eight was inviting opportunity to knock. And the question was, when was a time opportunity knocked because you'd built a door for it to knock in? And how did it pay off? Brenna replied, in my editing business, opportunity knocks every time I get an inquiry and I've created plenty of doors for that. My website, my social media profiles, and my directory listings to name a few. These opportunities have paid off because I've built a successful editing business from them. And Brenna is one of my inspirations for uh, her editing business. I just love the things that she's done and I'm always learning from her. So uh, yeah, she's got a really well-rounded platform and so definitely something to aspire to. If you want to check out her website, it's under bookmarteneditorial.com and I'll put that link in the show notes. Also, I was thrilled that Brenna actually recently featured me as an author in her author spotlight on her blog. So while you're over there, you can read that article and that um, I just went into a bit of my process and um, my writing journey so far. So if that's something that's interesting to you, definitely go check that out. On episode nine, taking chances on yourself with Jessica Renwick, I asked the question, what's a risky decision you've made about your indie author business that has paid off in unexpected ways? And Brenna replied, I think the most risky decision I've made so far in my indie author business is to write in a very specific niche, niche, niche. <laughs> I'm a reader. Sometimes I don't always know how to pronounce things. <laughs> Anyways, queer. Uh, so I'm going to read that again. The, the most risky decision I've made so far is to write in a very specific niche, queer golden years romance. It hasn't paid off yet in terms of income because I haven't published the books yet. But lots of people have expressed interest in the series, which makes me hopeful. And um, yeah, I've been kind of watching her go along as she develops this series and I'm excited to read it. In fact, I get to read uh, her lead magnet this weekend because, well, because 
I'm not going to tell you why, but uh, I get to I get a sneak peek of it, and I'm very excited. I took a, a peek at the first page today. I'm like, ooh, this looks really good. So <laughs> anyways, um, thank you so much, Brenna, again, for being a consistent commenter. And for everyone else as well, I love hearing your feedback and how you've responded to the challenges in your businesses and things. So please, at the end of this episode or when you have a minute, I know it's not always possible when you're listening to a podcast to comment right away, but um think about the question. If you have a minute, come and leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you and just hear who's listening. All right. For me this week, um, I did make some progress on my manuscript, which is Every Star That Shines, the Peace Country Romance. And um, I did end up having to bump my date with my editor. I bumped it by two weeks, which I think will be enough as long as I keep going on it. Um, I was sad that I had to bump it. I'm trying to work through a mental block of not being able to make my own deadlines right now, the ones for my own work, and uh, this didn't help. <laughs> However, my editor, who is also a, a friend of mine, um, was very gracious about it, but I still feel bad. So I'm sorry, Jen, uh, if you listen to this. <sighs> That's just something I'm gonna keep working on. Anyways. The manuscript itself is currently at 52,000 words, and I am just starting to write into the false final battle, which is sometimes called the foe. I call it the false final battle, which is that um, conflict that leads right into the black moment and moment of truth, about three quarters of the way in. So uh, considering I'm expecting the book to be at about 72, 73,000 words, something like that, I feel like I'm right on track for pacing and length are mostly on track. Uh, honestly, it actually feels a little bit unbalanced for word count. I think I have a longer word count in the first half, but that might just be my perception right now. And we'll see when I get through the last sections here, maybe it'll be about right. <laughs> I can't always tell these things. I thought I was doing okay on the first half, but I thought maybe I had a little bit extra and I'd go over my expected final word count. But now I'm feeling like I'm going to be right around that word count, I final word count I expected, which means that I'll probably have a, a bigger first half. And so when I'm in revisions, I may need to balance that out a little bit. So, but that's for future me to worry about. <laughs> Present me just needs to finish the manuscript. Um, other good news is that I, I finally called our internet provider this week. Um, as you know, if you've been listening, I've had multiple internet issues over the last well, really for about the last year, but um, those issues have affected my business recently quite a bit. And so I'm excited that um, we will soon get those resolved. We are going to be getting faster internet in the process and it's going to cost more, but um, that's just the way things are. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear back from the technician basically about when he can come out, he or she can come out to, uh, to adjust the equipment we have to deal with the issue. I am all caught up on editing projects. I mean, I'm still working on, I'm working on a short one this week and I have a few other short projects that I'll be doing over the next week or two. Um, I got my big one done last week on time and it was a lovely story. So that was great. Um, but I do have some openings coming up. So if you need some work done for either develop, developmental editing or to get book descriptions written, I do have some space. Um, if I don't fill those slots though, I do have, I was thinking about it today. I hope to get some knitting patterns published that I've kind of been waiting in the wings for a while. And I just, I, I've got them ready. I just need to set aside the time to actually write them up and get them onto the next stage of the process. So, uh, yeah, it's not like I don't have stuff to do. Always stuff to do. <laughs> okay. I thought this week I would mention as a tool of the week, um, the Emotional Wound Thesaurus by Angela Ackerman and Becca Puglisi. Now, you are probably familiar with the Emotion Thesaurus, which was, I think, possibly their first one. And it's also, I think, one of the absolute most useful um, thesauri, especially to get started with. I recommend it to most of my editing clients if they don't already have it, um, because it's just so helpful for, re you know, sometimes I just... Like even actually yesterday, I was 
trying to think of the name of the emotion that I was trying to ha express for my character. It was like not just an easy one, like anger. Like it was a it was a weird emotion, and I don't remember what it is right now. But I'm like, what is this emotion even called? I could see her face in my head. I could imagine how she was feeling, but I didn't know what to name it. So I actually just got my emotion thesaurus. It's right on my desk. So I, I kind of just looked through the table of contents. I'm like, oh, yes, yes. Well, that's what it is. So, but I mean, it's useful for much more than the table of contents. If you're trying to then show that emotion rather than just tell people about it, then you could actually flip to that entry, for instance, and look at the different things they have in there about how to... Um, relay that motion to your reader without just saying this person was angry which is about the most telling and most boring way you can say it um so they have that but then a few years ago they released the emotional wound thesaurus which is my second favorite thesaurus that they have for writers and they have a lot um and they're all good, but this one I find especially useful with character development. And so a few weeks ago when I was developing one of my antagonist characters in my story, um, I actually used this one in conjunction with another one of their thesauri called the Negative Trait Thesaurus, because I had this character who was acting in a certain, like she was acting as an antagonist, which is great, but you know, like I, I want her to become somebody like for the most part, I want my antagonist to be treated with compassion. Like I want to treat them with the compassion as a writer, even if I don't like their actions, if I don't like their um, motivations, I want to at least understand what those motivations are and what made them the way they are. And I think that's how you treat antagonists compassionately um, because it, if you understand what a character's wound is, and that includes your antagonist, you can at least have some empathy for them or sympathy at least. Um, but you know, like it, it just, it, it makes your characters also more three dimensional. So I had this character, she was acting in a certain way. And um, I think it was about halfway through the manuscript by then. And I hadn't spent a lot of time working on figuring out her motivations or anything like that. She was just there to fill this role of being an antagonist to my heroine. But I'm like, you know, I think I need to understand more about this character. Why is she behaving this way? And also I'm writing a sweet romance, so I can't have her be a serial killer or <laughs> not that women are usually serial killers, but, um, uh, you know, like I, ha I don't want her to be full out mean girl for no reason. And she's a grown woman. So, you know, but, Grown women can still be mean girls. Um, but anyway, so I dug out the emotional thesaurus, emotional wound thesaurus, and I dug out the negative trait thesaurus, and I, I used them in conjunction. And within an hour or so of just kind of spending time in both of those thesauri, um, I, I had her fleshed out. I understood what she was, why she was behaving the way she was, but also had then brainstormed a plan for how her thread would weave through the rest of the story and have some resolution by the end. Because of course, in a romance, um, quite often it's the heroine's, I don't know, it's her charm. It's her specialness that helps other characters resolve some of the problems in their life. And that is not going to be an exception here. Um, so I needed to know what it was her problem, what problem she actually had besides a bad temper that my heroine would actually help her resolve. So yeah, um, I highly recommend all of the writer's thesauruses by Ackerman and Puglisi. But um, if you haven't checked out the, emo the emotional wound thesaurus before, I definitely recommend going to take a look. It's a really wonderful resource. Okay, so this week uh, I had hinted be before that I had some challenges and the challenges that I had were actually um, personal challenges. I had a really difficult family situation crop up and I don't want to go into details just yet. I will eventually, but this is the kind of challenge that means everything in my life is about to change, which is not the kind of challenge you have to deal with, fortunately, very often. Um, but... <laughs> It did kind of smack me aside the face. It was one of those things that's like, you know, this is going to happen eventually, but I didn't expect it to happen 
right now. And exactly how much my life is going to change has yet to be determined. Um, I'm hoping that by next week I will have a better idea what that's going to look like going forward. Uh, but this week I've been grieving the life stage that I'll be leaving behind. And, um, like sometimes grieving really hard and that has tanked my productivity or at least it feels like that. But then I looked, when I looked, when I was preparing this, I went and I looked at my hours for the week. And even on my least productive day, I still clocked almost eight hours. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> now, yes, those were kind of scattered hours. I wouldn't say they were the, my most focused hours of work that I've ever had, but I still put in that much time before I gave up, I guess. I don't know. Um, actually, it's mostly been my afternoons this week. I, I, Afternoons are my low energy point as it is. And this week, like I've had such bad brain fog from, from all the stuff that I'm dealing with that it's just, uh, some days I just haven't even worked on in the afternoon. But anyways, um, looking at that though, and like on my unproductive day, I'm, I'm clocking eight hours. It's made me question even more to myself. Like, do I need to cut back in general and adjust my mindset about how much I'm working and what productivity means for me. But also my family situation that I'm dealing with is probably just going to force me to do less work for the next while as it plays out. We'll see what happens. I mean, as I said, I'm not really sure. And it does depend on which way this goes. Uh, however, one thing that I did manage to do this week, which is like one of those things that you just only do when you can't think, which is <laughs> what I what's been happening. I went and I cleared out weeks, like years worth of old emails in a couple of my inboxes. And I have like three email addresses I check every day. Um, so that felt great. I got most of them down to like, I, I use, I, I use Gmail for all of my email addresses and I have like several, I use their, their sorting tabs. I find them very useful. I don't use them all, but, um, I think I usually, I think I have at least two and usually three activated depending on what the email address is for. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> I've got most of those down to less than 20 emails sitting in there, which feels great. <laughs> so when you're having a rough time, um, those small wins matter. And for me, small wins means feeling like I accomplished something. And so just clearing off emails was a, was a good feeling. So, um, my topic of the week for my my, I'm calling it my practice of the week. Um, and this is just basically just kind of my big idea, I guess. And it's making adjustments when change changes your capacity, which is essentially what happened to me this week because of grieving and, and the stress of thinking about what's happening. Um, my capacity went down. That's why my hours went down. Um, so things change, life changes, like there's always change. This is not news to us, but it just feels like to me, sometimes I, it feels like I just get comfortable in one life stage and I'm on to the next one. Or I feel like I get a handle on one aspect of being an author and find out that there's a whole new skill I'll need to unlock to reach my goals. Or maybe shifts in the industry mean there's something I've been doing that will no longer work. And sometimes the shifts in industry shifts actually make my job easier, but like not that often. Um, so for me, planning and replanning are my coping mechanisms to handle this. Uh, so this is like partly a need for me to reestablish some sense of control, but it's also partly a need to feel like I can handle what's coming and not be swamped in a sea of uncertainty, meaning that I can still handle, like for me to know that I can still handle my responsibilities while coping with the change is really important. And if the planning proves this won't be the case, then tells me I need to think about my priorities and decide what needs to stay and what can go by the wayside. And it helps me get to the point where I can cope and manage. So sometimes the best thing to do when you're adjusting is to give yourself the time off of your normal work to rest and process things that you need. So as I said, I've been struggling with this and honestly, it's really hard for me to give myself permission to rest. Um, I do give myself permission to rest on the weekends, but that was a process of learning to do that. Um, and it's really important to me to do that. And, you know, when I try to cheat myself and, and do 
my normal uh, like business kind of work on the weekends, but then that means I'm not doing the other things I need to do on the weekends, which sometimes that's actually just housework, but that is a form of rest for my business, right? And I also usually take a full day to just not do much. Um, anyways, when I try to cheat myself, I very quickly uh, run out of steam. And so I've gone through that cycle enough times now, I don't do that hardly ever anymore because it's just not worth it. Um, sometimes if I'm on a deadline crunch, I will. That's about the only time. But during the week, like this week when I've been struggling to give myself the permission to rest in the afternoons, I've thought about it like every day. I'm like, I should just go have a nap. But I haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to just tell myself, go go have a nap. Go read a book. And I need to. This is why I'm I'm thinking about this, about my mindset around work. And I think I need to to shift it some. Um, and again, I may not have much choice soon, but to take a break from my normal work routine. So I'm going to consider that time that I'll be reprioritizing toward the adjustment period as a break, as in a change is as good as a rest. So I'm going to try and keep my normal writing schedule and editing and freelance schedule during that time, because I need to do both of those things to continue to generate income. However, some of my admin and marketing activities may be cur curtailed as much as my actual commitments allow. Um, for instance, I did book a blog tour for the Undines tier and that's starting this month. So I'm, I've already committed to some things there. So it's going to be an interesting balancing act for sure. Um, one thing I decided today is to go back to a monthly cadence for my author newsletter. I've been doing uh, it twice a year or twice a month, I should say, for the last year. And um, while that was easy for me last year, I don't know, I think my, part of it might be the commit, time commitment of this podcast, actually. I've, I've actually only been able to do one a month so far this year. And I'm like, you know what, I need to stop stressing about that fact. I think it's just time to go back to once a month for a while. I know my readers won't care for the most part. So um, I think that's what I'll I'll do now for now, and then I'll likely continue to make changes to my schedule on the fly as the situation evolves. And um, going to the my Clifton strengths because you knew it was coming. Um, my adaptability strength is really low. It's number twenty six, which is why I think for me personally, I need to plan to adjust before I can actually adjust to change. Um, my husband's is at number seven. So he's like way better going with the flow than me, which is, I think, how our relationship has survived. <laughs> and he is amused and mostly tolerant of my need to plan my way through a change. Um, but despite this, I've long since learned that there's no sense denying a change that needs to happen, which is what happened this week. Like once it became clear that this change was necessary, um, it was just like, oh, Okay, well, that's reality. Let's move on. And the grieving process is part of that. Uh, so then my brain immediately started moving in that direction. It's kind of like when The Flash, if, you, if you've ever read The Flash comics, I haven't, but I've watched the TV show and um, like he's constantly creating new timelines. He, it takes him forever to learn that, he, that that's a bad idea. And every time he creates a new timeline, then he feels like he has to go back and tries to fix, fix it and then creates another t new timeline. So it, that's like his, his personal struggle is that he needs to learn to accept the things that have happened in the past so he can just move forward. And I feel like that sometimes as humans, we just struggle with that. That's why that's really relatable. Um, and essentially, we're all constantly creating new timelines based on our realities. But there's actually only one timeline. And within that, our trajectory often changes, right? Um, and that's because when our plans collide with reality, reality is always going to win. So it's best to work with it instead of against it. <laughs> so got all philo philosophical on you this week. Um, my mug quote of the week is just this one sentence from a longer quote, which I'll read in a minute. Uh, the, the quote is from Lao Tzu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but the part I'd put on a mug is let reality be reality. And the full quote I found, which I loved was life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Don't resist them. That only creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. 
that let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. And really, what choice do we have? <laughs> That's what I say. And I actually found a bonus quote by Joseph Campbell, who is uh, the famous guy who came up with the hero's journey idea. And the quote is, we must be willing to let go of the life we planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. And I feel like this is a lesson I'm constantly relearning. So my question of the week for you is if you've been affected by the stresses of the world and there have been significant ones lately, or just the natural stresses of life, what are you, are useful practice that you use to help you adapt in your business or in life? And you can leave a comment. As I said before, you can leave a comment on this episode of the podcast on my website at tolinawinters.com slash podcast episode 10. I look forward to hearing from you and uh, thank you so much for having coffee with me. Coffee and Real Talk for Writers has been produced by Tolina Winters. The music for this podcast was written by Josh Rickard of joshrickardmusic.com. You can find episode show notes, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you're feeling generous, buy me a coffee at tolinawinters.com slash podcast. And be sure to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice. Tell your friends to come by too. The kettle's always on. So until next time, I hope you keep writing and keep it real. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.